So um, while you're standing up, I am waiting for my slide to come up. I'll tell you, I'm going to give a quick overview of DREV and then talk a little bit about the recommendations I made. So DREV, for those of you who don't know, stands for Design Revolution, and we're a nonprofit. And we focus on two areas, um, improving health and increasing income. And our target customers, and this key customers, we're not looking at beneficiaries, we're looking at customers, live on under $4 a day. We're really looking at products that scale. And so originally Paul Pollack, one of our founders, was like a million people. He throws out a few other numbers. From my standpoint, it's just a lot of people. We're not talking about the village level. We're talking really global level. We're trying to tackle global issues where we have not seen a design solution. So I'm going to tell you three quick things about us. One is that we design world-class products. So these are products that perform on par or better than the best products on the market. And what you see here is me talking to several doctors at a public hospital outside of Delhi. And this is for a phototherapy device, Brilliance, that Cynthia mentioned in my intro, which is now on the market. But I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, the second key thing to know about us is that our products are market driven and that means they're not donated. We sell them or we sell them through our partners or our partners sell them on the open market. And what does this mean? That they have to be affordable. Um, it also means that they have to bring value to users. And I think this is a key issue when we're talking about the customers we are. If they bring value, people will buy them. And if they value them, they're also going to use them. And that's key, obviously, if we want to get to impact. And I love these two pictures because on the left-hand side, you see a market of what we usually think of in a lot of the economies we work. But the right is also a market in India. They're both from India. And this is a medical device fair in Delhi um, about a year and a half ago with one of our engineers on the right. The third thing to know about us is that we're user obsessed. We're not just human centered, but we're user obsessed. And we see the user not just as the person, but the market, um, the context they're in, whether they lose power for 16 hours a day, all these different issues that really go into designing really great products. And designing really great products to us, like I said on the last slide, is really about knowing the markets too and knowing the business model and the best way to get these products to people. And from our philosophy, that brings about sustainable impact, not just a one time, but ongoing, particularly if donor funds, which was mentioned in the beginning, get pulled out, these products should be continue to be sustained on the market if the customer finds value in them. So I'm going to talk a little bit about one of the projects we're doing, um, the Jiper Knee, and we, we now call it the Remotion Knee, and I'll talk you through the name change. Um, but you see a picture of it here on the right. And it was originally, oops, let me go back. It was originally developed by a group of students at Stanford University who eventually merged into us at DREV where we've iterated the product and are now scaling it with um, some of the original students. Um, a little bit of background. Uh, these are three amputees. They all have amputations above the knee. Does anyone know why um, or what the main cause of amputations are in what we call the developing world? Landmines is usually what people say. That's wrong. That's third. Um, but what's number one? Vehicle accidents. I won't make you suffer. Um, but it's vehicle accidents, usually trauma coming out of vehicle accidents. So someone walking by the side of the road who's hit by a truck. Somebody riding on the back of a moped gets hit. And this is very, very common. Um, so these three gentlemen, um, what are their options? They live in India, um, not that far from Jaipur. Um, and they actually don't have many options. And in many cases, you see people holding bamboo staffs. And that's really their only option in terms of kind of hobbling around for mobility. Um, so thinking about options, this is a pneumatic knee. Um, we call it a smart knee. This is something what our American veterans returning from Iraq or Afghanistan, if they were to need a knee, this is what they would get. But $20,000 is clearly out of their price range of our target customers. This is a low-end polycentric knee. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about polycentric in a minute, but it more mimics the natural gait of how you walk. But it's a low-end one, and it's really designed for Westerners. So not a lot of dust, not a lot of water, um, not a lot of the conditions that we see with our customer groups. And then this is um, the ICRC knee, so the International Red Cross knee, and it's a single axis, and I brought one here tonight. So... Um, Single axis, it just rotates along a single axis. So you can imagine what that means for stability, and I'll pass this around. 
Um, and then just a little bit more background. What's the annual need? What's the size of this problem? And what we see actually is there's about 3 million amputees per year who need a prosthetic knee. And if you think about the leg system, there's a socket that the residual limb goes in, there's the knee, there's a pylon, and then there's a foot. And the knee's the most expensive and usually the most complex component, which is why we started with it. So I'm going to show you a video, and this is um, a man named Ash, and he's walking on a single axis knee similar to the one that we're passing around. So single axis, just think of it like a door hinge. And he's doing something we call a 10 meter walk test, which is just walking 10 meters back and forth, and it helps process us get a sense of the gait. And then this is the Jiper knee that was developed by the students. And this is a young man named Kamal. Um, who was in a motorcycle accident, and he's doing that same 10-meter walk test. So you can see there's a big difference with the stability. Um, and it uses a polycentric mechanism like you saw with um, the metal one earlier that was around just over $1,000. Um, when, when we started iterating this and working with the original team, one of the things that's really great, too, about the, the knee that we've designed is that it allows for local um, behaviors, for example. A lot of the Western knees we sell in the market don't allow for bending, for squatting, for praying, for sitting cross-legged. And there's a young man named Vishambar who's sitting cross-legged wearing one of our knees. So I want to address impact because I feel very passionate about when we talk about design in the social sector that we also talk about impact because it isn't just about design, the activity of designing something or the thing, the product, but it's actually reaching that social impact. So how do we look at it with this project? And by the way, this picture is Kamal um, who climbed a tree shortly after you'd seen him do the 10 meter walk test. Um, we look at numbers of amputees fit. So this is more kind of like output, for example. And right now we're at over um, 4,600 amputees. And this is through a partnership with the Jaipur Foot Clinic in India. Um, I think the really telling, though, in terms of impact um, is compliance. Are people still wearing it six months later? And over 79% um, are. Um, and what we're finding, and we're just starting to do better research now, is that we're seeing that there's less social stigma um, now that people are able to be mobile. People are able to hold jobs. Um, I talked to a teacher who had lost his job once he had lost a limb, and now he's able to return to work. Um, where are we now with this particular project? Um, this is the original Jiper knee that you see here, and I have another one. I have my, my bag of tricks here tonight. <laughs> Okay, so this is the original Jiper knee, and this is the one that's being used in India, and it's, you'll see it's pretty crude, and it, it clicks, and that was actually some of the feedback we got here for our web viewers. Um, but this was actually some of the feedback we got, so you'll see when I pull out version two that we put a no noise dampener in. Um, another kind of feature I'll point out that came back from early feedback with this particular knee is that when you wear it under pants or a skirt, you have a not very nice profile here, so it's pretty clear that someone's wearing a prosthetic. Um, shortly after the project came into DREV, uh, we did a second iteration. And you can see here, and if you see here, there's a, there's a noise dampener, so it's a little quieter. We're still working on it. And then you'll see also the curvature has changed. Another feature we learned from this version, too, that we tested in Ecuador was that um, it takes a lot of energy to bring the leg forward. And so we added a spring. It's not on this one because people often pinch themselves when I pass it around. But there's a spring to help bring the leg forward. So I'll pass this one around to you. One of the lessons learned from that iteration was that it was too big, and I think politely one of our users said, well, maybe that's fine for you Westerners. You're bigger than we are. Um, so that resulted in the version 3, which unfortunately I can't show you tonight, but if you check in with us in about a month, you will be able to see it. But I can tell you it has a much slimmer profile, and we really tried to design it aesthetically beautiful. This is something we want people to be proud of. And even if they do hide it under foam or they do hide it under skirt or pants, it's really something that they feel very strongly about and are proud to have. Oh, and I should mention that um, with our market-driven model, really what we're looking at is how can we make this super affordable? And this is $80. And for a sense of comparison, I don't know if you remember, but the ICRC one that's going around is 105 So where are we now? Um, the knee is being used at several clinics in India. The Jaipur Foot um, Organization is the largest fitter of prosthetics in the world, and we're being used by their main clinic and then their second largest clinic right now. Um, it's also been fit through temporary camps and some of our own field work. And we're just now going into field trials with the version 3, which you'll be able to see next month. 
So I wanted to talk a little bit about how to strengthen our field. This is my way of, I guess, saying recommendations. Um, first, I, I kind of want to mention sometimes how we see the design process from the outside. You know, it's like identifying these problems, coming up with some ideas, proof of concept, call this the idea, but we really want to get to impact, right? And there's a lot of activity that happens between proof of concept and impact. If you want to take a market-driven model like we do, you have to commercialize it. And there's a lot of work designed for manufacturability, final design, tons of iterations like you've seen with our knee to get to commercialization. But to truly have impact, you want to deliver at scale. You don't just want to have five amputees wearing it in Ecuador like we did with our version two. You want to be able to have this accessible to any amputee who needs it. <clears throat> who needs it. So um, one of the things I just wanted to mention that I see a lot in our sector is there's a focus on the innovation or on the thing. And innovation doesn't equal impact. I kind of see innovation as the idea area on the left-hand side. But actually getting to impact requires a lot of activity. And it needs a lot of funding. It's um, a lot of times we see funding that's focused on, quote, the seed activities, which is really that idea phase. Um, and the other thing I was going to mention is getting from here to there, we call the valley of hard work. And I think those of you who are designers can probably appreciate this. Um, and who knows what it's usually called? The valley of death. <laughs> um, so we call it the valley of hard work. Um, and so I guess my message there is to love the entire design process and embrace it. And I guess the one thing I would add is I think universities are really great at the early stage, but they have a really hard time getting to the later stages of impact. And it's just the natural outcome of how an academic institution is structured. Um, so I w we would love to see like more support throughout the entire design process to actually reach impact. And then the last thing I would say is we really believe everyone should have design training and design thinking. If you think about going from idea all the way to impact, you need a lot of different skills and a lot of different people. You need business people, you need market analysts, you need designers, you need all sorts of people. And the skills that we have in design, if you think about problem solving and user empathy and all these sorts of things, would hugely benefit everybody in this whole design process. So I want to end with this picture of Pranima. Um, you might have seen this earlier. But I love um, Pranima and the story around Pranima. She was um, in a car accident with her father and her little brother, and her brother unfortunately lost his life. And she lost her leg. And she was in engineering school at the time and had to drop out because she, lo she lost her mobility and needed to be taken care of. And she was fit by the Jiper Foot Clinic with one of our knees. And what she told one of our engineers when she was there was, I can return to school now. And for us, that is so empowering because we love the fact that she's going to school and she's going to become an engineer and hopefully be working on a lot of problems that she sees in her own society. So with that, thank you very much.